The debut of the Pandur Shore ad at AUSA 2025 marks an explicit and timely move by General Dynamics Land Systems toward closing a tactical gap that has become increasingly visible over the past decade, the vulnerability of maneuver formations to low-flying, cheap and prolific aerial threats. The adaptation of the Pandur EVO to a short-range air defense role is not merely a technical variant but a conceptual repositioning of how mobile land forces intend to survive under skies saturated by drones, attack helicopters and precision munitions launched at short reaction times and low trajectories. Unlike legacy, high-tier air defense assets whose mobility and deployment timelines are tied to strategic scales, Pandur Shorad is framed for ground brigades that must fight while moving, often without the luxury of pre-positioned missile umbrellas or static sensor grids. What General Dynamics chose to showcase at AUSA is therefore as much about tempo and expeditionary readiness as it is about cannons and missiles. The architecture chosen for this variant revolves around Moog's reconfigurable integrated weapons platform, a turret family already known in U.S. military circles for its modular build philosophy. By anchoring the system on RIWP, the manufacturer avoids the common trap of designing a bespoke turret that locks the vehicle into a single ordnance path. Instead, the vehicle becomes a carrier of optionality. In the baseline demonstration loadout, the RIWP hosts a 30 by 113 mm XM914 automatic cannon paired with short-range missile options including the well-proven Stinger. The system's integration envelope further accommodates APKWS guided rockets as well as heavier missiles such as Hellfire. This tiered approach to effectors matters operationally, forces can scale from cost-efficient, high-volume anti-drone engagements to heavier anti-armor or anti-rotary wing shots without changing platforms. In the contemporary attrition-heavy battle space, the ability to fire something cheaper than a multi-million dollar interceptor at a $4,000 quadcopter is not optional, it is economic survival. Mobility is the other pillar of the concept. The Pander Evo chassis, already a known quantity among NATO operators, retains its high-speed road profile with stated top speeds above 105 km per hour and operational ranges approaching 640 km on internal fuel. This is not incidental, a Shorad asset that cannot keep pace with the spearhead of an assault or the withdrawal of a battlegroup under pressure becomes a logistics burden rather than a protective envelope. By preserving the drivetrain, Cummins diesel power pack and ZF transmission characteristics, the air defense variant inherits the same deployment logic as other Pander Evo family members. More importantly, the vehicle stays within the roll-on-slash-roll-off transportability limits of AC-130, meaning it can be inserted into forward theaters without reliance on strategic airlift. For coalition operations in crisis zones where days matter, the difference between a platform that fits into a C-130 and one that demands a C-17 is measured not only in cost but in whether it arrives before the window of relevance closes. Protection, too, adheres to the Stanag 4569 envelope expected from a modern 6x6 armored vehicle, safeguarding the crew against small arms fire and fragmentation typical of contested maneuver. While air defense platforms are traditionally viewed through the lens of their sensor and effector suites rather than armor, battlefield experience in Ukraine, Syria, and the Caucasus has underscored a harsh lesson, Shorad is now a frontline job, not a safe rear function. Vehicles tasked with hunting drones are themselves prime targets for loitering munitions and counter-battery fire the moment they emit or engage. Hardening the carrier is therefore a prerequisite for the turret to matter beyond a first salvo. The strategic context behind Pander Shorad is clear. The global proliferation of small UAS has inverted cost exchange ratios across conflicts. Quadcopters with improvised munitions disable million dollar assets, loitering drones saturate sectors faster than traditional air defenses can cycle engagement helicopter survivability near the FIBA has sharply declined. Armies that once assumed air superiority as a structural condition are now forced to internalize air denial at the battalion level. Against this backdrop, Pander Shorad is not positioned as a silver bullet but as a distributed layer, a localized immune system embedded into maneuver columns. 
Its role is not to replace medium or long-range SAM batteries but to prevent those batteries from being overwhelmed by low-end volume and to allow ground units to maneuver without waiting for the Air Force to sterilize the sky. Another consequential aspect of the system is its openness to mission reroll beyond Shorad. The Pander Evo family already accommodates a spectrum of turrets, mortars and support modules. By leveraging a common hull and electrical architecture, an army can shuffle roles within a fleet without rebuilding its logistics doctrine. A formation that today fields Shorad variants can, in another campaign, refit the same hulls as fire support assets. This multi-role continuity is not trivial in procurement climate, budgets must now justify reason flexibility, not single-use elegance. Yet the success of a platform like Pander Shorad will be determined not in exposition halls but in its system's integration, sensors, data links, and battle management. The stronger threat is not merely a drone but a swarm network with decoys, false returns and delayed activation munitions. Whether Pander Shorad can ingest target cues from higher echelons, share its own finds to peers, and discriminate friend from foe in a compressed decision window will decide whether it becomes a stopgap or a staple. The modularity of the RIWP turret gives the hardware frame, the software, networking and counter UAS doctrine will supply the competitive edge. The U.S. Army's interest in layered air defense for maneuver units has been explicit in recent years, with programs ranging from mobile lasers to kinetic and non-kinetic counter UAS kits under rapid procurement tracks. In that ecosystem, Pander Shorad competes for a doctrinal niche, a wheeled, air-transportable, kinetic-first Shorad node that trades the reach of bigger systems for speed, modularity, and deployment agility. Its prospects will likely hinge on how well it can be paired with sensors, onboard or remote, and whether its cost per engagement aligns with the economics of the threats it is meant to defeat. From an operational analyst's vantage, the arrival of such systems signals a broader structural shift in how armies think about air parity. If the past 20 years fostered an assumption that enemy aviation could be suppressed upstream, current battlefields punished that optimism. Pander Shorad represents a ground commander's insurance policy, a locally owned veto on the sky overhead, carried in the same column that needs it, without waiting on distant headquarters to unstack the air tasking order. In that sense, its value is not only physical but temporal, it makes response times endogenous to the unit under fire. The demonstration at AUSA is therefore less an isolated unveiling and more a visible marker of where land doctrine is migrating under duress. It is the codification of lessons written in explosive footage across multiple wars, maneuver is naked without proximate air denial, drones are not a nuisance but a systemic threat and the cost curve of defense must be rebalanced by adaptable, mobile, multi-effector platforms. Pander Shorad, as presented, fits precisely into that pivot. Whether it matures into a widely adopted solution will depend on trials, procurement appetite and how rapidly counter-counter UAS tactics evolve. But its appearance in 2025 is not accidental timing, it is a response calibrated to the battlefield we are now living in, not the one doctrine expected.